You are listening to Action Design, your monthly insight into the field of behavioral economics and its applications to the world around us. We bring you leading practitioners from all industries to discuss cutting-edge behavioral research and how to practically apply those concepts to the development of consumer products and public policy. All right, so we are good to go here. So uh, hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another uh, riveting episode of Action Design Radio. Um, uh, this is your host, Eric Johnson, and I also have Zarat Khan on the line. Hi, everybody. Zarak, uh, say hello to everyone. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of starting this podcast is jumping the gun and saying hello to everybody while you're still introducing me. Hi, Action Designers. <laughs> One, of your, One of your many talents. <laughs> Um, and we are honored to be joined with, uh, do you go by Catherine or Katie generally? I go by Katie. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I did. I always try to uh, earn the side. Catherine means I'm in trouble with my parents <laughs> or I'm publishing something. I, I never had that problem with like Eric is just a pretty, you know, there's no real longer version of that. So, um, so mine is both. Um, but anyway, we're here with, uh, Katie Milkman from, uh, the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton. Um, so Katie, I figured we can get started. If you want to give us a brief introduction to kind of your, a little bit of background and your, um, you know, kind of how you came into behavioral science in general and, uh, kind of what your research focuses on, maybe anything you're, you're kind of working on now that you're excited about. Sure. Um, so I'm a behavioral economist at, at Wharton and, uh, I got here through a long and winding road. I was an engineer in college and, uh, didn't really think that behavioral science was for me. I took one economics class and all of the assumptions made about human rationality struck me as preposterous. So when I looked at the behavior of my own roommates, our inability to pull ourselves together and hit deadlines, behave rationally around members of the opposite sex, um, manage our own you know, drinking as freshman girls and so on, it didn't really strike me that we were optimal decision makers. So I, I defected from economics early, went to the engineering school, studied operations research, and decided to get a PhD because I got really excited about quantitative social science research, but not economics per se. Uh, I ended up in a PhD program at Harvard that was joint in computer science and business. And it was only there that I discovered behavioral economics. It was a burgeoning field at the time, and it was embedded in some of the coursework I did my first year, and I completely fell in love when I learned that people were actually baking in assumptions to standard economic theory about ways that people are predictably imperfect. I thought, this is for me, and I've been studying it ever since. Uh, Maybe because of my engineering background, I focused on using this field to solve problems. So I, I like taking ideas and then constructing a a solution. So I I focus on how can we use our understanding of the peculiar ways people deviate from making perfect decisions to help them make better choices. Uh, Right now, a lot of the work I'm doing is focusing on how we can help people create lasting behavior change. So how can we create habits, for instance, around things that are important to do to have good life outcomes like exercising regularly, taking your medications on a daily basis, eating a healthy diet, studying hard in school, making wise financial decisions. So that's really the focus of my work. And, you know, I think that that is um, a large part, like why we were excited to chat with you uh, today, because, you know, as as we're recording this, um, you know, a lot of folks are thinking about New Year's resolutions, thinking about fresh start and new habits, um, getting out of old bad habits and starting new good habits. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, as Eric and I were thinking about, um, about this episode and about our conversation with you, um, kind of was struck initially by the, the question of like, well, why, like, why do we do these on New Year's in the first place? And you know, Eric brought up the, the fresh start uh, effects. And so we want to get your take on that. Um, and, you know, how this helps or hurts us uh, when we're doing behavior change. Sure. Well, I will say that I do tend to be more popular in December and January, I've noticed, because of the topic of my research. I get a lot more calls from reporters and friends. Uh, so, anyway. Very, very seasonal interest. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so I've done some research on the fresh start effect. So along with Heng Chen Dai, my amazing former student who's now a professor at UCLA, and Jason Reese, who's my colleague here at Wharton, we've written a couple of papers about this phenomenon where at the start of new cycles in our lives, we feel extra motivated and extra willing to, to tackle our goals. So it won't surprise anyone that New Year's is one of those moments, but it's also true that at the start of a new week, month, following birthdays and following holidays that feel like fresh starts, so you could think about a holiday like Labor Day, and following other breaks from work, we have this renewed motivation to tackle our goals. And one of the reasons that that seems to happen, based on our research, is that at the start of a new cycle, we feel like we have a separation from our past failures. So on January 1, when I look back at the year that's passed, and I think about all of the things I screwed up on, I think about, oh gosh, you know, I meant to lose 10 pounds, but I didn't. I meant to be a better mentor to all those colleagues at work, but I didn't really follow through. I meant to take that MOOC so that I could develop a new skill, but gosh, I didn't do it. <laughs> Um, and, oh, I meant to quit smoking, but I fell down on the job there, too. All the things that we failed to do, we have this renewed optimism about our ability be to do them now because we say, well, that was, that was the old me, and this is the new me. This is January 1, New Year's me. I'm new and improved, and we feel like we can do it with that clean slate. Now, um, that fuels many goals that are unsuccessful, but the good news about the fresh start effect is that it fuels us to try, and you can't get anything done if you don't try. And it's funny that you mentioned uh, MOOCs, because it's and it's something that uh, I have regularly told myself, like, oh, like, I'll subscribe to these emails, and all these course systems are interesting, and um, I feel like I've gotten to a point where, uh, unfortunately, like, I've almost like worn out my my fresh starts on this where you know I've like signed up for a couple of different classes and maybe I've even taken you know gotten a few lessons in um but you know at this point I feel like every time I get a new like a new course comes out or uh, a new year like I, I it's, it's hard for me to break out of that is that something that that you have kind of encountered as well where it's sort of it's hard to like give yourself that that fresh start yeah, it's an interesting question. We haven't really studied what you're describing exactly, which is that at some point, um, if you keep trying the very same goal over and over and over again, you will give up because you'll realize you're banging your head against the wall. Um, I think the thing that's kind of amazing is how willing we are to give ourselves a fresh start and say we're turning over a new leaf repeatedly in our lives. And I, I think it's a good thing that we're so over-optimistic in general. But I agree with you. I'm sure that we all at some point burn out on some goals and recognize that it's time to give up. But a lot of the big things in life, the things that are particularly identity relevant, my prediction would be that we never really give up on ourselves completely, or at least I hope we don't, because that would be awfully depressing. Right. Yeah. Apologies to all the moves. <laughs> so, uh, so kind of like <laughs> building on what you just said there. Um, so one thing I was thinking about is like, I think the fresh start effects is a really good example of one of those. A lot of like the really good behavioral in insights that we kind of find in the field, like seem very obvious in hindsight. And, like I read about the fresh start effect. I'm like, oh yeah. Like I always, I take New Year's seriously. And, like a Monday is always like a different week. It's like all these, um, you know, it seems obvious in hindsight that we can all relate to that. But you know, do you think that kind of helps the fact that we are so kind of driven by thinking of things in bigger periods and different starts. Um, do you think that kind of helps us or hurts us in behavior change, like in uh, generally speaking? And like, is it something we can take advantage of throughout the year uh, when we inevitably probably falter from whatever our New Year's resolutions are? Yeah, well, again, I don't have data to support this, but my intuition is that it's got to be a helpful thing, that we have the opportunity to pick ourselves up after we fail because we can identify a new fresh start that's ahead of us and we can say all right I screwed up last month but now it's February I can do it now or you know I screwed up um, last year but I just celebrated my my 40th birthday and so now I really feel like I can take this on this is going to be a new decade it's going to be a better decade for me so I think the opportunity to put bad things in the past and in the rearview mirror it seems like it has to be helpful um, because otherwise we're going to dwell on those failures and, and never move on. Um, in our research, we have shown that you can use these moments. You can call them out for people and motivate them to do things they might not otherwise be willing to do. So, for instance, um, inviting people to start saving after an upcoming birthday 
turns out to motivate more savings than inviting people to start saving at the same point in the future but not mentioning the fact that it corresponds to a birthday. So when I see that birthday associated with the savings opportunity, we think what's going on is that it feels like an appropriate moment to begin saving. Um, It's a momentous occasion. It's a fresh start. So we're drawn to this opportunity in a way we wouldn't be if it were just an equally distant moment in the future when we could start saving. Um, We've also shown this around dates like the first day of spring or some other calendar marker that feels momentous, like the end of the school year for students. Those are moments when they are more interested in starting to work towards goals and getting reminders to do that than the same dates if they aren't labeled as, say, the first day of spring or the end of the academic year. So it does feel like there's this opportunity, and in fact, the data bears out that there's this opportunity to use fresh starts and what we know about fresh starts to help people make more um, self-controlled decisions. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like that, it, 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 we can take advantage of ourselves, but also if you're, you know, somebody's trying to motivate like positive behavior change, like saving more, like that's something you should take advantage of and thinking about your interventions. And it reminds me of I think um, I think they talk about this in the Power of Habit uh, that book. How like I remember reading this and I like realized that how obvious it is, but it's like when you for, for big life events, like when you move into a new apartment, you just get like inundated with like ads and stuff in your in your mailbox for like new residents. They know that's sort of like the fresh start effect, and that when um, when you move somewhere, you kind of start changing all of your habits. Like that's the time to like get people going to their grocery store or whatever it is that they start doing. Yeah, it's a really nice point. There's actually, I would say, there's sort of two separate pieces of psychology in that. So, in our work on the fresh start effect, we try to isolate the impact of um, just these literally shifts on our calendars. So there's nothing changing in your life it's just Monday, or it's just you've celebrated a birthday, or I just remind you that you're celebrating a birthday. And we can say that just those cycles in our lives, they create these opportunities. But there's also really great research on habits that shows um, literal changes in our circumstances. Like I have a new commute uh, to work, or I have a new home address. And so now I don't walk by the bakery where I used to pick up a brownie every night, and I have to replace that habit with something new. Maybe I find a new bakery or maybe I start picking up a smoothie. It's an opportunity to actually replace a bad habit with a good one. So I think of those as actually very distinct, even though they have a lot of overlap in the intuitive way that they work. Um, One is literally a physical set of changes to your life, um, a very real set of changes that are happening, not in your mind, but uh, in your daily routines. And that creates an opportunity to to replace bad habits with good ones. It also creates an opportunity, by the way, to replace good habits with bad ones. They have to be just as wary of that. Um, But then there's there's this separate phenomenon, which is these cycles in our lives, where there's literally nothing that changes except what the calendar looks like. And those also promote opportunities or create opportunities for change. So I think it's good to keep that in mind. yeah, about these like different times we can do that fresh start effect. So like shifting gears and sort of another uh, you know related topic to this is like uh, I know you you write in research about what you call like the want and should conflict, and how it's really hard to do how to uh, make decisions between the things that we know we should do and the things that we want to do in the moment. And I think when it comes to like New Year's resolutions and making these kind of commitments to behavior change, like that's kind of the core tension in all of this stuff is that we know we should you know get a smoothie instead of the, you know, the baked, the donut from the bakery or whatever it is. But, you know, in the random, in the, in the moment, we just don't really do that. So can you kind of explain a little bit about, you know, how you define that and, uh, you know, maybe what some of your research has found that, you know, why that number one makes behavior change hard and um, what are some ways we can kind of work around that to reach our goals better? Sure. Well, um, first I should say that there is an incredibly long intellectual history of thinking about this issue of temptation. So I um, am a recent contributor to the literature, but, um, you know, since Homer, we've been talking about the fact that people struggle with self-control. Um, the words I use, which I also did not coin, are want, should, and I talk about want wants being things that are instantly gratifying. So unhealthy foods, um, lowbrow TV shows, uh, video games, surfing the web, 
uh, sitting on the couch instead of going to the gym. Those are wants, the things that give you instant gratification, but you know aren't great for you in the long run. And then shoulds are basically they're polar opposites. So eating the healthy food, going to the gym, um, saving more for retirement. Go, uh, these are all of the options that you know you ought to engage in and they would make your life richer and better in the long run, but they just aren't as fun and feel good while you're doing them. So uh, the unfortunate fact about human nature is that we all know we should do things, but uh, and we plan to, but when the future becomes today and we have to execute on those plans, we're likely to give in to the temptation to do what's instantly gratifying instead, to reach for the wants, to sit on the couch and watch TV instead of exercising, to choose pizza instead of salad, to um, spend that new paycheck on an exciting vacation or uh, a new watch, whatever it is that we're craving, instead of setting it aside for retirement savings. So, um, So this is a big problem, and it's one of the problems that leads us to need solutions like a fresh start to try to reset and and, um, ratchet in our self-control. I've done a lot of work on what are different solutions we can offer to people. One of my favorite ones, uh, and this I think is best illustrated when you think about exercise, is something I call temptation bundling. And that is trying to link a want with a should. So you can only enjoy that want when you're engaging in the should in order to make the should more appealing. Let me be very concrete. So imagine that um, for you, a want is watching lowbrow TV shows. And you know you should do less of it. You should spend time with your family or working um, longer hours in the office on your startup. But whatever it is, um, instead you often give in to indulgence and go binge watch TV. Imagine you also should exercise more, but it's hard at the end of a long day of work to motivate yourself to go to the gym. So temptation bundling would provide a solution to both of these self-control problems. The solution would be only let yourself watch these lowbrow TV shows while you're exercising. As a result, you'll start craving trips to the gym to find out what happens in your latest show, and you'll stop wasting time at home on lowbrow TV. Not only that, you'll actually enjoy the TV and your workout more combined because you won't feel guilty watching the TV and time will fly while you're at the gym. So there are lots of different ways you can construct these kinds of bundles and my research has shown that uh, this can be an effective way to promote behavior change. We actually ran one experiment where we showed that temptation bundling helped get people to the gym more. At least in our study, it, it worked for about seven weeks. Then the gym closed for uh, Thanksgiving break. Students who were in our study went home. Maybe they forgot about whatever um, tempting entertainment they had linked with the gym and then the effect actually went away. So uh, it also highlights the importance of figuring out how to make things have real staying power. But temptation bundling at least can help kickstart better habits and get us going for a little while. I think that's a fantastic example um, and a great, a great tool for people to use. Are there, are there other th- suggestions that you have for, uh, for our listeners and also probably for Eric and myself uh, of things that we should be... Definitely not me. I, I make perfect decisions all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, of how we could, you know, uh, how folks can kind of uh, improve their decision making when they're setting their goals for the new year and then and sticking through uh, or sticking to them, um, and potentially even like creating those opportunities to have a fresh start if they um, uh, if they need need that during the year. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of the work that's been done um, that I'm going to reference now is not my work, I should say. Um, There's a decades-long literature on how do we follow through on goals, and my work on temptation bundling and fresh starts builds on that. Uh, Some of the most important things to do are um, making your goal known to others, right? So uh, other people will hold you accountable and creating accountability for yourself so that if you fail to follow through, there's some kind of a consequence. One way to do this is actually by using what's called a commitment device. So literally putting something on the line you'll forfeit if you fail to achieve your goal. A cool website that I always recommend is a website called Stick, S-T-I-C-K-K, Dot com it was actually created by a behavioral economist, not me. I wish I had co-founded it because I love it. But, um, I, but I'm, an, I'm an avid stick user myself, so I will, I will back that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's a really neat site. So you can go to this site and you can create a goal like I want to lose five pounds in the next two months. And then you can put money on the line that you'll forfeit if you fail to achieve the goal. And they'll only charge your credit card if you fail. And then you... Um, 
you give the site a referee, so someone who will report back. So it shouldn't be you, right, because you might be inclined if you have these typical self-control problems to lie and say you did it even if you didn't, if you don't really want to pay that fine when two months have passed. So you maybe you choose your trainer or your spouse to be the person who reports to the site about whether or not you followed through. And that's, uh, that's a good way to put your money where your mouth is so that there will be real consequences if you don't follow through on your goals. But other ways to create consequences are to make your goals public. So tell people about them. You can post about them on Facebook or Twitter or whatever your preferred social media is. Um, uh, another thing you can do is try to get social support. So you can use those same channels to ask people to encourage you and remind you to follow through. Uh, it's really helpful to make concrete plans about exactly how you'll follow through on your goals. So rather than saying an abstract goal like, I'm going to lose five pounds, but not thinking through how you'll do it, you might say, uh, okay, every morning I get a frappuccino, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that out, and I'm going to eat the same diet basically otherwise, and because of the calories in a frappuccino, that ought to actually get me to my goal of losing five pounds in the next two months. Um, maybe it's that you're going to start going to the gym on Thursdays uh, and Tuesdays. And so you could be concrete about that too. But whatever it is that you need to change in your life to achieve your goal, you need to make a plan about that and be as concrete as possible. So you know exactly how to act on your best intentions. And it'll be harder to um, put off or fail to do this vague thing that you said you intended to do. So those are a few of my best tips for how to achieve your goals yeah and again i'll, I'll vouch for uh, stick.com that makes it really easy because I, I think a lot of us know we need accountability for something and we need some sort of consequence like i always use the example like when you think about your job like you know you always show up to your job on time because there's like social consequences there's monetary consequences like you'll get fired eventually or like you won't get a good performance review if you don't show up on time um and there's all these reasons that like even in the, you know we wake up in the morning we don't really feel like getting out of bed but we get up and we make it to work on time because there's all these you know, social pressures and things on us. And, you know, I try to think of, about that for any other kind of habit you want to develop or, you know, better behavior and that how can you kind of create that um, similar incentive. So like something like stick, I think helps a lot where um, it just makes it really easy to create those monetary um, and social incentives in, you know, a couple minutes on a website to help. Do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, another thing that, that I, you kind of mentioned with like, you know, sort of the social aspect is I think um, one thing for people to consider that, you know, fits a lot of these that's helpful is a lot of the, it's a lot more popular now to have these kind of group, like a, a common one I know for most people for New Year's resolutions is like exercising. Um, and it's more and more common now to have these kind of group fitness and like health um, groups, like things like CrossFit and like Orange Theory and stuff like that, which cost more, but give you a, like a built in social support network. Um, that sort of keeps you accountable and kind of like builds in that kind of uh, that kind of social aspect that you know number one adds some like consequences to it and also just makes it more enjoyable to actually you know it's a little bit of that temptation bundling where uh, no, I'm sorry uh, yeah temptation bundling where like um, it, it becomes kind of fun because you're making a social group and um, you know kind of making some friends while you're doing this thing you want to yeah exactly that's a great great suggestion. Cool. So um, I think that kind of covers the basic questions that we had around this. Is there any other kind of like parting thoughts or kind of like, uh, you know, things people should think of as they're you know, setting goals for the rest of the year and um, thinking about how to kind of commit and make those happen? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we've covered the key stuff. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting behavioral science out there about how to follow through. And so I'd, I'd also say for the people who are into behavioral science at all enough that they're listening still at this point in the podcast um, maybe I'll recommend some books that you might want to pick up to get even more tips about how to use these techniques to improve life outcomes none of these are written by me I've never written a book so I'll just say I'm giving free advertising to other people because I think they deserve it um, I think Robert Cialdini's book Influence is a wonderful book about uh, what are the factors that shape our decisions I think um, Charles Duhigg's The Power of Habit is also a very worthwhile read. And I think um, Nudge by Dick Thaler and Cass Sunstein is also a, a terrific book as you're trying to understand what are the forces that shape our decisions and how can we use them for good. So those are some readings I'd recommend that may help people who are trying to figure out how to achieve their goals in the new year. 
Great. And um, if people want to keep track of your work and the type of stuff that you're working on, like what's the best place to kind of find more of your research and, uh, you know, keep track of the type of stuff you're working on? You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm at K-A-T-Y underscore Milkman. <laughs> or you can check out my website, which is CatherineMilkman.com. I have to say, Katie, I, um, I follow you on Twitter and I actually laughed out loud at a tweet of yours the other day. Um, that was like a, a conference or event that you were speaking at and the label for like your microphone was Professor Milkman female. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed out loud at that too. <laughs> Somehow it seemed like just a funny encapsulation of who would be wearing that microphone. Right, right. I mean, I laughed. I'm glad it amused you. Yeah, I laughed for that. And then I also I thought I was like maybe in some alternate universe there's someone named Professor Female who's a milkman, and, and I chuckled with that. <laughs> um, I don't know what kind of conference they'd be good speaking note. at. So but. A good reminder, people can follow you for psychological, for behavioral insights, and for comedy. So a lot, a lot of reasons there. <laughs> I don't want to oversell the comedy. It's mostly behavioral insights. <laughs> a little, little sprinkle of humor there as well. So. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I try. Well, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I think this is really valuable. I think it will help uh, people out a lot as they kind of uh, get set in the new year. I know we're recording this in late December when people are probably kind of in the middle of doing most things that they don't want to be doing because they're probably eating a lot of food at holiday parties and not exercising as much and spending more money than they should on gifts. So uh, I think when we release this at the end of January, it'll be perfect timing because people kind of make their pendants for that and uh, work on uh, taking advantage of the fresh start effect. Yeah, that sounds right to me. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays, everyone. Happy New Year. <laughs> yep. Happy New Year, everyone. So, all right. Well, thank you so much and uh, we'll talk soon. My pleasure. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available for download on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. Once more, that is action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States, plus Toronto. Also, on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Once again, thank you for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.